We've all seen grandiose visions of our future in space and science fiction since the early 20th century. The golden age of pulp sci-fi ramped us up and then came Star Trek and other more realistic depictions. While fiction and reality don't always align, there's more here than meets the eye, so stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode 23, recorded July 1st, 2022, for August 5th, 2022, Space Science Fiction and Reality. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Space Science Fiction Edition. I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and my co-host for this installment is the sagacious Jeffrey Notkin, Emmy Award-winning star of Meteorite Men, among other things. Say hello, Jeff. Why, thank you, Captain Rod Pyle of the Starship <laughs> This Week in Space. What a sag- sagacious, is it sagacious or sagacious? Oh, yeah, saga- sagacious. I think it's sagacious a with a hard G, yeah. You should I, be uh, an editor of a science magazine with a vocab like that, mister. Oh, what a terrible idea that would be. Hey, I've got a dad joke. A dad <clears throat> joke? Are you ready? I thought this was yeah. a space podcast. It is, but but Ant keeps telling me that I'm giving out dad jokes. Okay, so uh, I was looking for something. You'd think science fiction jokes would be a rich, fertile loam, but I I had to struggle a little bit. So my first one is a guy ended up at a party full of World Health Organization medics. Obviously, he was at the wrong Doctor Who convention. Oh, <laughs> nice one. Uh, uh, yeah, I thought I thought it was headed towards Doctor Who, but I couldn't see where it was going. Well, um, how could like you not? Artist. Right. Well, and okay. Oh, wait, wait. Three no, conspiracy oh, oh, theorists walk into a TARDIS. Don't tell me that's just a coincidence. <laughs> okay, wait, your I turn, pal. I don't get it. I don't get it. Three conspiracy. It's a conspiracy Can you explain it to me, joke. please? I'm very thick. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just copy well, them down. I'll, I can't explain them. I'll take notes on that later. Okay, well, you get one of mine later. Uh, you get one of mine now, and then the second one later in, in the news stories. Perfect. So, But mine's 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 space joke. It's not science fiction joke. I didn't know we were doing science fiction jokes today. I would have written science fiction jokes, especially. Oh, well. well the fact that you All wrote right, Rod, them impresses me. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, no, I write my own materials, mister. I, I'm not, I'm not <clears throat> David Letterman. I, I don't I don't have a writing team anymore, I wish. So right. here's my first joke for you, Captain Rod Pyle of the Starship This mm. Week in Space. Why did the janitor at Kennedy Space Center tell everyone that he was a critical part of the space program? Because he had cleared the tower. <laughs> oh dear, I got crickets. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For, hey, for those of you who can't, who can't see us, Rod is wiping the tears of joy out of his eyes with a, <laughs> of, with of, a of hilarity. Hanky. Okay. Well, before we embarrass ourselves further, you have another one, but it's for later, you said, right? Yes, because it's relevant to one of the news stories. You're saving If I, if I may one. save it, if I may archive it temporarily. You can do whatever you want, buddy. <sighs> but If only do, I'd heard that in, more often in my life. But thank you for the for <laughs> the, the pregnant latitude. pause is obvious. Um, let's do some headlines, shall we? Yay! We call this one hot, hot, hot. A new Neptune-sized exoplanet is showing us a new side of planetary science, and it's called LT nine seventy nine seven seven nine B. Because what's in a name? It's located two hundred sixty light years away, and is classified as one of them. Their hot Neptunes. Circles its parent star every 24 hours. So a year on that planet is a day here. So that's a close in orbit. The orbit is so close, the atmosphere is so charged with solar radiation that it uh, is about 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit there, which would melt lead, chromium, and stainless steel. So it's a little bit like Phoenix. Uh, The weird thing is, with this kind of starshine hitting it, the atmosphere should be gone. It should have been stripped away by all that solar radiation, but data from the TESS and Spitzer Space Telescopes uh, have have verified that it still has an atmosphere. So this has put it on... The the reason I mentioned it today is this puts it on the list as one of the early targets for Webb. 
the Webb Space Telescope, which will uh, be sending, well, it's already sent its first images down. We'll be seeing them on July 12th. And as of now, all NASA is doing is uh, giving us little teases here and there. So, Jeff, how would you like to live on a hot Jupe, a hot Neptune? You've, you've lived in, in Tucson, so you've come pretty yes. close. Yes. Yes, uh, which is uh, the the only thing hotter uh, on the face of planet Earth than Tucson is Yuma, uh, which is a, a little bit closer to the sun. And so yeah. nine, <laughs> LTT 9779b was discovered by astronomers at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, a uh, wonderful state where I've had many adventures. And the thing that's very appealing about the this new planet to real estate investors is that because the the year is only 24 hours it would it would only take you about two weeks to pay off your 15-year mortgage oh so i found that well a, done, a very attractive sir. proposition thank you and so rod i know we're going to talk about star trek later but do you think that the horta from devil in the dark from the original <laughs> star trek could live yeah. on, in the heat of that planet Probably, but only if it could have Mr. Spock around to continually say, pain, pain. And that is the one, that's the episode where McCoy famously says, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer, except yes. he doesn't yeah. actually say that. What are you, if, if we could digress for just a moment, Captain Rod Pyle, are you familiar yes, with the concept of the Mandela effect, the Nelson Mandela effect? No. This is a a phenomenon. It's uh, it's a a sort of uh, mass uh, uh, a misunderstanding or misremembering of an event in history. Mm. So apparently, if you if you canvass people, if you ask people what happened to Nelson Mandela, it's very common for people to say that he died in prison, when in fact that is not right. what happened. But there seems to be this this enormous, uh, very prevalent misconception in history, and some people take the Mandela effect as evidence of the fact uh, of evidence that we were living in a constructed reality, and that it's a glitch in the matrix. When something like I know this is a science show, so I'm just saying this for entertainment value. But, yes, sir. But I think the damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a is an example of the Mandela effect because Bones never actually says damn it, Jim in any of Star Trek, the original series. It's not until the second film that he says, damn it, Jim, because they were not allowed to say damn it on television in of the 90s. Not. It was the 60s, yeah. Well, that's interesting. That's my story. It's it, a bit it, like it, it's a bit like Bogart never actually saying, play it again, Sam, in Casablanca. Right. Well, or, uh, or Kirk ever saying, beam me down, Scotty, or beam me up, Scotty. There is a fascinating web, website uh, or on Medium, of course, where a Star Trek fan and tech guy has analyzed all of the most popular expressions in Star Trek and how many times they're used. So, of course, because we have the internet, we have a page dedicated just to that for your reference. All right. And that headline, by the way, came to us from futurism.com. The next one comes to space.com. And it's called Rock Pile in Space. And no, I'm not impugning my own name. Recent evaluation of data from the Osiris Rex asteroid, excuse me, from the asteroid Bennu, which was investigated by Osiris Rex, has revealed landslides on this 1800 foot body, which is something that we haven't seen on small bodies in space before. We've seen them on planets and on moons, but we haven't seen them on asteroids. Um, Bennu is at least in part what is known as a rock pile asteroid, which I think Jeff's going to have something to say about, which is a conglomeration of loose pebbles in space. And it has an overall density just slightly higher than water, which I found really, really fascinating. And these pebbles are just held together by their gravitational attraction. So the landslide was the result of an impact with another smaller body. It indicates that the surface material is dry with little cohesion according to the project scientists. Characteristics of the landslide show that when the impact first threw up mass from Bennu's surface, it didn't rise as fast or as far as it would have if another body had hit a hard, solid surface. So this further identified the characteristics of a loose conglomeration of rubble drifting through space. The resulting, the returning material coming back down to the surface triggered a small landslide, which is what started this whole conversation in the first place. And the roughly, they think, 20-inch wide impactor, whatever it was, created a crater about 230 feet wide. 
studies will continue. Jeff, what do you know? This is so fascinating. It is, it is events like this on asteroids that generate meteorites. So we have an impact from, in this case, a smaller body onto Bennu. Some material is moved, it's thrown off into space, wanders through space. Eventually, some of those end up on planet Earth, land as meteorites. And it is this type of loose conglomeration, as you said, that generates, we believe, a particular type of meteorite. And they're, they show different materials within the same within the same meteorite fall, which is, is quite unusual. Typically when a meteorite falls and we recover numerous samples, they're the, the interior of them, the makeup of all the pieces we recover is the same, but it, mm. it, it's different with, for example, the meteorite Almahatacita, which is believed to have originated on just such an asteroid. And now it is time for my second space joke, which Wait, can is, you just say that name one more time? That was pretty, Alma, pretty astounding. Yes, Alma Hatta Sita. Easy for you is to a, say. Is a meteorite like that was a witnessed fall meteorite. And when pieces were recovered, mm. there was a great variation in their their makeup, in their structure. And so it was fascinating to meteorite and asteroid scientists to examine pieces of this because it seemed to represent lots of different materials within one asteroid. Hence the idea of this loose conglomeration. Okay. Which now leads directly into... For hilarity. You are prepared. You are prepared. Okay. Yes. Why did the beloved Saturday morning cartoon character volunteer to join the Osiris-Rex mission to asteroid Bennu? I don't because know why he, did he or she? <laughs> because he wanted to see a Barney Rubble pile. Oh, wow. You wrote that? I got a drum roll. I did. Oh, man. You are hired, my friend. I'm going to put you thanks. on the same payroll I am. Well, wow, um, that's big bucks, Thank you right? for that. Yeah. Oh, always, especially as an editor, because, you know, we, we do very, very well. Um, before uh, we move on, I, I have an errata item. A couple of weeks back, I gave an email address for anybody wanting to pitch an article to Ad Astor Magazine, and I said send it to editorial at nss.org, only to find out there apparently is no editorial at nss.org anymore. Jeff will not be surprised, having formerly been the president of that organization. Things happen occasionally. So um, no or if there is, it just doesn't work properly. So for now, if you have something to send, use rod.pile at nss.org. And pile is spelled P-Y-L-E, not the way it was spelled in our last joke. All right, we'll be and back to I discuss. Give a, may yes? I give a quick plug for Ad Astra just before the break? For listeners oh, who aren't familiar with this, no, this wonderful space magazine. It, it, is, it is the official publication of the National Space Society. It's a beautiful quarterly space magazine full of original content. And our host, Rod Pyle, is the editor-in-chief. And it is a wonderful, fantastic science and space magazine. And I would encourage you science writers out there who want to get published to follow Rod's suggestion and reach out and submit. And if you want to read the magazine, you can join the NSS and then you get it free. What a deal. Yeah, and, and this coming from our esteemed past and I hope once again future president of the National Space Society. Oh my gosh, thank you. What a lovely thing to say. Yeah. I'm president emeritus. That? I'm president yeah, emeritus right. of the NSS. That's the best kind, right? All, well, it all sounds the very impressive. Uh, it sounds like a Latin <laughs> president, a Latin speaking yeah. president. Now we know why oh, professors of course. love it so much. And that's why the magazine's called Ad, Ad Astra. Duh. Yeah. All right. So we'll be back in a couple of moments to discuss the intersection of science fiction and space flight after this short message. All right, we're back. Now, one of the things that I find fascinating about looking at science fiction and how it relates to space flight is the historical relationship there. Because Jeff, you and I are just barely old enough to remember the very trailing edge of the golden age of, of sci-fi, of the pulps and so forth. And for us, probably more moving into the comic book era. But, you know, I was around before Mariner Mariner uh, 4 flew in 1965. And up until that point, we still thought the solar system was kind of a groovy place, you know, that 
The other terrestrial planets like Venus and Mars might be somewhat Earth-like. Venus might be a little hotter and swampier. We couldn't see beneath the clouds, but we thought, well, maybe we could go there and you know, we just have to keep ourselves in a cooling environment suit or something. And we thought Mars was probably colder than Earth and probably had a thinner atmosphere, somewhat like standing up on Mount Everest, but it turns out, of course, to have uh, almost no atmosphere at all and to be devastatingly cold. And of course, everywhere in the solar system is radiation, radiation, radiation. So as as time has gone on, the, the solar system has become an increasingly hostile place. But that wasn't really my point. My point was more that when I look back at the golden age of sci-fi, so let's say 1930s up through 1950s, arguably, you know, how good a predictor was that of what we were going to experience in space flight? And we moved from that into the Apollo years in reality, and then with the shuttle being in orbit around space for over three decades, and I'd say that the 1930s were not a very good predictor of where we were going. And uh, I guess my question is, what can we learn from that about looking into the future from today? What do you think? And I think we have to partially blame the great Chesley Bonestell for this this somewhat idyllic view of the solar system that we had. And I say that mm. with the utmost respect because he was a brilliant artist and most many listeners will be familiar with the, the marvelous paintings that he did imagining what the planets and moons of our solar system looked like. And I had, I think it was called the Golden Wonder Book of Astronomy when I was very young. It was a large That's... format hardback book. It was illustrated by him and I was just mesmerized by this book. And of course, when you're a kid and you look at paintings like this, you go, well, that must be the way Titan actually is. And what a view you would have of the rings of Saturn from this point. Right. And it, it was very While appealing. While you're being slowly did, roasted to death, right? <laughs> right. I did want to go to all those places. And I, I think yeah. Chesley Bonestell was a big influence. I know he was a big influence on my life and, and my developing interest in spaceflight. Back to your question. That... There's some, I think there are multiple answers to this. So what what can we learn? I think we first have to recognize that science fiction as a genre has evolved. And so the predictions are going to be different and I think frequently darker. And this is a topic that you and I have spoken about in in our own conversations, that there is a, there is a tendency to move towards darker bleaker and in many cases more violent versions of sci-fi that we grew up with star trek is an example batman battlestar mm. galactica lost in space we've all seen uh, and, and in many cases and doctor who excellent excellent shows i'm not criticizing them i'm just saying it is a very Wait, different uh, okay well, hold on hold on hold on time out are you are you seriously putting the early direct to one inch tape doctor who's on par with the original star trek oh Mr. gosh British no guy i'm just made, much, <laughs> much as i much as i love doctor who and i will maintain yeah. that that there was a certain level of writing in a lot of mm. original doctor who that was that was excellent and innovative and science-based and really fascinating original mind-bending sci-fi concepts and one of my criticisms of a lot of contemporary american Sci sci not just America, a lot of contemporary sci-fi television is that much of it isn't really science fiction. It's just a soap opera on a ship. But a yeah, lot of Doctor yeah, yeah, yeah. Who had contained well really deep science concepts. Okay. So if Sorry, we're going I didn't mean to, to say... Derail you, but... No, 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 it's okay. And I and I love original Doctor Who, but I also am the first to admit that when you when you watch some of the old black and white shot on video episodes from the 60s, they, they do look a bit thin. But that, but that doesn't diminish my love for Doctor Who, which also been a been a big influence on my life. The, the real answer to your question is is we have to realize that some science fiction is predictive and does, in a sense, come true or make itself come true, and some of it is wildly off base, and we're and, and it just never happened and never will happen. Thank God, some of it. But it can also be very disappointing. We when mm. we were kids, we thought. By now, we would have a permanent moon base and we would have gone to Mars and we would have giant orbiting space stations because the, the, the United States space program was moving so quickly in the late 60s and all through the 60s and into the early 70s when we were kids that it seemed like 
anything can happen. By the time we're adults, we will have those flying cars. Although we do have Dick Tracy wristwatches, I would like to point out. Mm-hmm. We, uh, the, 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 Apple, the Apple Watch and other brands are, I think, comparable to what Dick Tracy had in the, in the famous comic strip. So that's my answer. Like most things, some good, some bad, some spot on, some way off base. And I think we should dig into some of the things that, that did, did make the grade. Some of the writers that did portray an accurate or somewhat accurate vision of what the future came to be. I know it's a favorite topic of yours. Well, both of us. So, yes. I mean, it's impossible to have this conversation without going back to Jules Verne and, and looking at it from the Earth to the Moon. Ah, the in inventor which, of steampunk. Yes. Jules Verne. Close the inventor to your of heart. Steampunk. Yes, um, for sure. Uh, you know, where, where a number of aeronauts, I believe he called them, were loaded into a large uh, 50 caliber bullet shaped spacecraft, if you want to call it that, and blasted to the moon out of a cannon called the, I think the, was the cannon called the Columbiad? Yes, the Columbiad Space Gun. Well done. Yeah, which was well in remembered. Florida, not far from where KSC is now under the jurisprudence of the, uh, I think it was the Columbia Gun Club, wasn't it? <laughs> It was yes, I believe so. Politically improper. So these poor aeronauts who would have been reduced to little patches of red jelly had they actually been launched out of a cannon are sent to the moon and magically go into orbit then land there and have their adventures. And, um, you know, he for the time, this is, I believe, the 1860s, 1870s, he he did uh, a respectable job of, of thinking of ways that you'd contain an atmosphere he talks about microgravity. Uh, I think they have chickens along for for <laughs> eggs, and although he doesn't discuss it much, uh, food and and other things that, that would end up relating to reality. Um, was it predictive? Uh, not really, except for the fact that there was a journey taken. But then by the time you get into the early to mid 20th century, it's kind of transmuted from that to... Um, well, certainly by the 30s, rockets that all tend to look like Werner von Braun's V2, uh, the difference being, of course, rather than just going up into a ballistic suborbital trajectory, they're heading off to other worlds with an equally apparent lack of fuel supply because it's all crew and cargo and ray guns and so forth taking up all that space in that big banana-shaped rocket ship with some little teeny tiny magic fuel supply down at the bottom. And of course... Uh, rarely, at least in in a lot of the, the the pulp fiction, was gravity really taken into account in the conversation, and certainly not as we moved into television. But I'm getting ahead of myself. You know, the the thing that sold those magazines to young men, the generation previous to you and I, Jeffrey, were usually the damsels in, in distress presented on the cover, being held by some huge reptilian thing on Mars or another world, and everybody was and they wearing they always had a tight costume spandex was- suits. Yeah. Yes, or or gossamer like. So you see this this space this space vixen, and she's perhaps got a, a one of those those fishbowl fish helmet helmets, on, right? Yeah, and a ray blaster in one hand, and then this almost see through gossamer type dress, or a or a very form fitting spacesuit, and. I I love the lurid nature of those pulp covers. <laughs> there, there is some well, there, really there was certainly artwork. a message there. For, for adolescent <laughs> boys, wasn't there? Which but was I, primarily well, audience. Yeah, but when you think about it, you've got so these space women would actually be tough, resilient women. They were able to overcome the 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 challenges of space flight, and they're battling aliens. And would they really be wearing a little skimpy outfit like that? Wouldn't they be wearing some sort of battle armor? So yeah, I completely get your point. This was obviously a sales tactic, but they are quite quite exciting and sometimes lavish the, these covers yeah and, and no, the, the original artworks. arts become tremendously collectible and valuable now as i as i'm sure you know right so and, I, and, I think they were i'm sorry go ahead no you go ahead i i think there are two there are two predictive things in in the jules verne book the first is it's it's a little obscure but i find it fascinating so to go back to the columbian space gun it's not so terribly different from the concept that was presented by the tragic character Jerry Bull, the the Canadian engineer and artillery expert 
who was obsessed with the idea of putting satellites or possibly even larger spaceships into orbit using a giant cannon. And he did mm. extensive work on this project and he could not get support to develop it from his own government. He tried with the US and I don't know if you're familiar with the story, but he eventually went to bit. work for Saddam Hussein building this, su right. this super gun. And there's a brilliant documentary film about it from HBO called Doomsday Gun from 1994. And I just, I find it fascinating that, that Vern came up with this we go, well, that's kind of absurd to just put people in a in a thing and blast it into space. But Jerry Bull really was working on that. And I think that if he'd had the support, it, it may have come to a reality. I don't, I don't really think you could fire people into space, as you said. They would probably be jelly on the inside of the capsule. But it might have been a viable way to launch satellites. And I just think it's a tragic story that he didn't, he wasn't recognized by his own side. And so he he went over and started working for Saddam Hussein, who was the only person who would fund his research. And he was eventually assassinated, allegedly. Well, and there was a group years ago who may still be around who were working with a large caliber artillery uh, piece up either in the northern US or southern Canada uh, on a similar experiment. And then, of course, we have Spin Launch, which has a centrifuge, which spins... Right. Uh, spacecraft payload uncrewed by the way it's just hardware very small hardware up to uh sufficient speed that it tosses that out of what essentially is a spinning catapult into the atmosphere and then a rocket ignites to uh take it hopefully up to orbit so that that's in test mode so you're right that is kind of predictive where i think we have kind of an interesting intersection is we get to star trek in the early 1960s where we're still seeing this it's not lurid anymore, but per, per se, but we're still seeing, you know, velour miniskirts and women in these very kind of pre-programmed, typical sexist roles, um, along with the realization, the rather advanced for its time realization that that modern society in space one day will be truly multicultural, which was not happening, at least not in uh, in the U.S. at that time. Uh, with the realization that people also bring their humanness to their space adventures and melodramas. So it was kind of an interesting merging of something that we hadn't, I, I don't recall seeing in science fiction before that, at least on television, certainly, which is truly human drama as opposed to the kind of silliness that we saw in shows like Lost in Space. And as has been noted by by many scholars and enthusiasts in original Star Trek, as you well know, Gene Roddenberry hired a lot of exceptional, real science fiction writers like Norman Spinrad to write episodes. So he didn't just stick with the existing television writers group. He brought in real sci-fi writers to, to pen many of those episodes. And I think that's why some of them are so very inventive and, and we see things that were original at the time were, were thrilling when we were kids and watching original Trek for the first time and are, are now quite familiar sci-fi tropes. There's, there's so many things in that show that are for are an indelible part of popular culture. From the expressions like live long and prosper, Vul Vulcan mind meld, there's going to be a matter man antimatter implosion. These, these things, and as you said earlier, beam me up, Scotty, these expressions... What an amazing thing that one television show, I know other shows have done this, but but a science fiction show has instilled so many phrases into the language. And of course has, I think we would both agree, influenced our development in a technological way so that the people our age and, and the next generation who grew up watching these shows are now in positions in tech companies where they can be developed. And you well remember the old flip phone, the early cell phones that looked so oh, much yes. like Star Trek communicators. And we used to flip them open and make a phone call and pre pretend we were, we were being asked to beam up. Speak There's also, <laughs> well, well, oh yes, I probably shouldn't just assume that you did that, but I would do that <laughs> when I was maybe at a, at a punk rock club in downtown New York. And I felt like I got to get out of here and I'd open my flip phone with the hope of being beamed to a safer location, but it didn't happen. I had to jump in a cab. 
But we we st- we touched on this at the, at the beginning of the show. But there's this there's this utopian view in original Star Trek of of what space exploration is going to be like, and it's a super clean ship, and everyone has very attractive, colorful uniforms, and we have, of course different from other shows and films, notably Forbidden Planet, which many scholars have noticed it could well have been or seems to have been a direct influence on Star Trek because in Forbidden Planet, you have this this ship that, that goes, that arrives at the alien planet destination and we have the landing party consisting of the of the captain and the doctor and a third member going down to the planet. But... Mm. Notably, in Forbidden Planet, it, it's it's an all male, all white crew, and so that's something that Gene Roddenberry was able to change and is more, is more becoming more accurate and truthful as as we go forward. But I find that 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 pristine operational ship and and this very inclusive crew, even though the women are wearing. Uh, outfits that that might be seen as sexist or exploitive today at least he had the vision to have women officers and to have a diverse crew which as you well know was extremely groundbreaking at the time in television oh, yeah. he he was a very inventive guy obviously and the the i think it's more that star trek is such a part of our lives and culture that it has helped make the future come true rather than being predictive. Even the first space shuttle being named Enterprise mm-hmm. because of the of the lobbying by Star Trek fans to have a spaceship named after the Enterprise. This is making things in the real world happen based on fantastical things that happened in a sci-fi show. And in, to me, that's even more amazing than predicting the future. It's helping to build the future. Well, so I remember watching Star Trek at the same time the Apollo program was was picking up Cadence to land the first humans on the moon in 1969. And at the time, reflecting back on the science fiction I had read, which by virtue of the fact that I had been born in the late 50s, a lot of that stuff had been written before I was born or when I was very young, and um, it was it was interesting to note two things. One, the differences between what I was watching on television at the time, which was Star Trek and Lost of Space and the Apollo program. So you have these big, vast, powerful spacecrafts with multitudinous crews and people walking around inside as if there's magic push button gravity and all this kind of thing. And on the other hand, you have these little, tiny, frail, fragile spacecraft, the the Apollo spacecraft, the Saturn V rocket, the lunar module. They're just enough to get the job done at the moon, and that's about it. It's kind of a closed-end program. It's not military, like arguably Star Trek and other shows not lost in space were. Uh, Tiny crews cooped up in a little can, barely large enough that they aren't touching shoulders and they're sitting in their seats, as opposed to what we're seeing on television. And then if I take a step back, say, 10 years into the great science fiction of the 40s and 50s, um, there was this other component, which is everything uh, that was going on was about government and about collectives, you know, bigger cities in the sky, bigger spacecraft, fleets of spacecraft, often a, a military orientation and so forth. And interestingly, I think one of the things that was not predictive, which I'm thrilled with, is that with only a handful of exceptions, um, space has not been terribly militarized and the craft that have headed out there have not been under military commands. And I want to come back and get your comments on that, Jeffrey, when we return in just a moment. Excellent. All right, so I just threw out a fruit salad of ideas. Pick your pick your fruit item to respond to, if you will. Uh, I, well, there's so much good stuff, as always, Rod. Briefly, one of the big differences when we started to to witness the actual exploration of space is that is that when our astronauts landed on the moon, we're watching it in this very fuzzy black and white video, which is a heck of a contrast to the glorious colors of Star Trek. So we've been watching this very lush show. And by the way, I've been watching the remastered episodes uh, in HD on one of my streaming services. and Aren't they? So when you say remastered, so, that's also n- so new beautiful. visual effects, right? Oh, yes. Yes. Although, the, the Michael Kuda ones, yeah. 
But the visual effects have been done in a way that look like that's yes. how they would have done it in the 60s if they had the technology to do. They haven't overdone it. And it's, we so often see visual effects, especially uh, uh, digital, I, I think, CGI that's overdone, that maybe yes. overshadows the story. And there's been such a delicate careful intention in redoing the effects on Star Trek that I absolutely love it. And I'm a purist and I would normally go, you can't mess with original Trek. But in this rare <clears throat> instance, I think something has been made better by going back and respectfully redoing the effects. So anyway, can we've I, got Can this... I comment on that for just a second? Please. So when I was working Please. on Deep Space Nine, the, the brief three seasons I was there, <clears throat> we were actually tasked by Paramount with bidding uh, the process of remastering the original show with new effects. So what finally happened, we were bidding out in 1994 or something. And the bid came in at, I don't know, $3 million, which is laughable. I mean, that's a rounding error now, but at the time they went, oh, know, that's heaven like, forbid. That's, in, that's insurance for one episode now. <laughs> yeah. The heaven forfend. We can't, they, you know, they thought it was going to be $500,000 or something. So the guy I was working for, Gary Hutzel, said, no, we can't do that. So it languished for quite some time. And then, as I understand it, uh, Michael Kuda, who was the art direction our art director at Paramount for, I think, all the, all the uh, Trek franchise stuff after the original show, he started on Next Generation, was engaged to work with a apparently very capable effects team. But my understanding is that Mike, who was a great guy, was essentially tasked with keeping to canon, if you will. So I think what you're seeing there, uh, for instance, one of my favorite episodes is always a doomsday machine, but what made it almost yes! unwatchable was the wonky visual effects and the repeated, you know, multiple exposure passes that they did on, on the original uh, ship model and so forth. You watch it now, uh, you know, they still got the fluorescent 60s hot velour colors, even in the visual effects, but it's watchable. And the phaser blasts are good. And as you say, there's a lot of restraint in how the ships are modeled, the motions they're taking. It doesn't get silly and veer off into video game territory like, in my opinion, a number of the modern franchises have. So I greatly respect the restraint that they showed. And I should I should say it's it's Mike and his wife, Denise Okuda, who are kind of at the helm Marvelous. of that. Marvelous. So, well said. Sorry, I just it, wanted um, to drop it's that in. It's amazing that you said that because when the remastered track episodes with the new effects were first released, the first one I watched was the Doomsday Machine oh. because I thought that's the one that's going to benefit the most from having these new effects. And if I remember correctly, that was the episode that Norman Spinrad wrote, the great Norman Spinrad. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant science fiction writer with whom I once had the pleasure of dining in Paris, actually. He lived yeah. in, uh, in, in Paris for many years and I, I was, uh, in my brazen youth, I reached out to him and said, I'm in Paris and I, I'm a huge fan of yours and I'd like to take you out to dinner. And I got a call at my hotel. I slipped, I found out where he lived and I slipped a note under his door and I got a call at my hotel. The phone rang and I went, oh, that could be Norman Spinrad. And it was. And so he said, I got your letter and I'd love to go out with dinner it's f for dinner with you. And it so happens that today is my birthday. So Aww. it was marvelous. We had dinner in Paris and he was a friend of Philip K. Dix, one of my one of my heroes. And it was amazing to dine with Norman Spinrad and listen to his tales of of living and writing in the sci fi world. And he was a, a columnist for a book reviewer for Asimov's for many years and wrote many great novels. So, yes, that was a bit of a digression, but we can always find something to, we can always find a, an interesting story that's related to Star Trek. So back to, the, to your earlier point about the militarization of space, and it's interesting that you brought this up because yesterday, the day before we, we recorded this show, was the birthday of two very interesting characters in, in predictive sci-fi, in my opinion. Robert Heinlein, the great Robert Heinlein, it's hard to believe was born 113 years ago yesterday because his, his work still seems so modern in many cases. And the other, which I don't think many people would really immediately think of as a science fiction author, but in a way, I think you could claim that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was something of a sci-fi writer because his most famous character, Sherlock Holmes, used what were at the time 
somewhat fantastical scientific methods to solve crimes. And there was also a fantastical, almost supernatural element to many of the stories, which are typically later explained away by science. But I think The Hound of the Baskervilles is one of the best examples because it, it seems like a horror tale. It seems like it's a, a sci-fi tale about a, a monster but it, it isn't really. Uh, I, I won't give it away for if there's anyone out there who hasn't read Hound of the Baskervilles or hasn't seen one of the multiple TV and film versions, I won't give away the ending. But Heinlein was a was an example of of someone who often saw a militaristic vision of future space, and of course, Starship Troopers is is the most famous example of that. Although, as you will well know, Rod. The book Starship Troopers is very different from Paul Verhoeven's film. The the book is oh my yes, uh, many have said really an anti war statement. But then on the surface, Verhoeven's film seems to be quite a glorified battle film. But when you examine it more carefully, you you can also you can you can there are many interpretations of that film. I find it quite a fascinating film. Actually, but the the story of Heinlein's well, there are two. That there's a novel and a story that I think are, are 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 somewhat predictive. My favorite of all Heinlein's works is The Moon Is a Harsh Mistress, and it's such a it was such a bold venture, such a bold experiment for him because the the entire book is narrated in the first person, and it's narrated by by someone with a foreign accent. So the first few pages, when you read this book, you go, "Why am I reading this?" sounds like I'm talking to one of my friends from Russia. And after, after a few pages, you're completely enveloped in, in this story. And so this examines the idea of a lunar colony that, that wants independence from Earth. Lunar settlement. Sorry, we don't use colony anymore. A lunar settlement on, Earth, on the moon. That now, now I'm being redundant. A lunar settlement that wishes to have a separate identity from Earth. And of course, that's been explored many times. And Mm -hmm. Notably in The Expanse, quite a similar theme, another exciting show. But the Heinlein story that really intrigues me with its relevance to today is, is The Man Who Sold the Moon. And this is a short story about a character whose dream is to visit the moon. And it doesn't, it doesn't play out the way he expected. And if, if listeners have not read that story, it's a wonderful short story, very, very highly recommended. I'm not going to give the ending away. But to me, it predicts space law, and it tackles the idea of who owns the moon or who owns asteroids? How do we claim the resources on such and such an asteroid? Is it who gets there first? Is, it, is there a, a legal way that you can claim an asteroid or space resources before you get there? And that is, that is the clever underlying theme of, of The Man Who Sold the Moon. A wonderful story, highly recommended. Back to you. Yeah, since we've kind of gotten off, uh, so uh, you've taken us back into written fiction was a good thing. The only uh, thing I want to touch on before we move into the 21st century is um, just as we were on the cusp of of landing humans on the moon for the first time, 2001 A Space Odyssey comes out. It shows us this, it's interesting, for the first half of the film, this lavish, optimistic, realistic, beautiful visual effects that still hold up today, vision of... A uh, quick ride to Earth orbit in the Pan Am space clipper, sort of a, a different version of the space shuttle. Magnificent what a ship, orbiting though. space station. Oh, beautiful ship. Magnificent orbiting space station managed by Hilton, which makes sense, especially in, in light of today's commercialism. So we have a predictive of a shuttle. We have predictive of a space station. We have predictive of a lunar shuttle, which is something that we'll soon be seeing sort of a version of with Starship, hopefully. And then... The second half gets very dark with uh, the voyage to Jupiter and the crew getting murdered and the psychedelic light show getting down to the planet or wherever it was that is that Dave Bowman went. Don't need to worry about that part. But we did see this magnificent vision while at the same time, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we were struggling to get this very limited, magnificent, but very purpose-driven, fragile hardware just to the moon and back seven, eight times. And then that kind of came to an end and we spent the next... 30 plus years in orbit. So here we are in the 21st century. What kind of science fiction are we looking at? Well, we have shows like Mars, which was National Geographic's kind of weird mashup of semi-documentary interviews and I thought rather overwrought drama. 
Um, and like so many space shows, nobody smiles. Everything's very serious. And there's one catastrophe after another. And, you know, if you talk to astronauts from the 60s and 70s, when it really was pretty scary, they had a great time. They weren't thinking about emergencies and damage control all the time. They were out there having a blast living right on the, the edge of life and death. And then you've got shows like uh, all the new Star Trek derivations we've talked about. I'm going to leave Star Wars out of this because that truly is off in, into fantasy, I think. We don't expect that to happen. Star Trek, we expect or hope to happen. And then you've got The Expanse, which I think is one of those magnificent uh, uh, bits of bridge writing that really shows some of the fun things we want to see, like military conflict and spaceships going to far and distant places, but with this this sort of uh, huge baggage of of kind of the worst of human human um, traits going along with them. And it's not that I want to see dark, dark, dark fiction. It's that I just want to acknowledge that we don't leave our humanness behind. So yes, there will be moments of tenderness. There will be hopefully great democratic institutions and so forth. So forth. There will also be uh, cultural appropriation and domination and murder and mayhem and all kinds of other things because wherever people go, we are after all just hairly mon hairless monkeys at that point. Things I love about 2001 and the expense that I think are, are relevant to spaceflight in the future. The pace of 2001 is so slow. It's an amazing it's like space film. space flight, right? Uh, yes, exactly. No, that's exactly yeah. what I was going to say. And I saw it in 1968 when it first came out. I was seven years old. My dad took me to the Dominion Theatre in Leicester Square in London, England. And we saw it on the big, big screen at the Dominion. It was an amazing experience. I still have the original program. And it's a long film. And I was only seven years old. And I was able to sit through mm. the whole thing without fidgeting. I was so enthralled by it. But yes, that, that there, it's... I don't need, some people say it's monotonous. I don't think it's monotonous. I just think it, it, is, it is a very slow pace that begins to instill into the minds of the viewers, of the watchers, the grandeur of space, the immense distances that are involved. And it's so different from Star Trek where we just, just beam somebody down or just, oh, put it on maximum warp and we'll be there in 20 minutes, Captain. This, this <laughs> shows the investment of time and effort and hardware in spaceflight. And I, I absolutely love it. And by the way, when we were filming my show, STEM Journals, which we, we did after Meteorite Men, we did an episode, an engineering episode, civil engineering it was called. And we were walking, the director and the crew and I were walking down into a culvert that was being constructed out on underneath uh, I-10, west of Phoenix, Arizona. And it looked just like the ramp down to the discovery spot on the moon where they oh. uncovered the monolith. <laughs> and I stopped and I go, oh my gosh, this is where they discovered the monolith. And so we did a little bit. I, I always love including sci-fi references in my shows. I, I don't know if I've ever told you about that, Rod, but in, no. in Meteorite Men, in STEM journals and other shows, I've included lines from Star Trek, Doctor Who, The Prisoner, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And they're, they're usually, I would never use an obvious line. They're, they're usually uh, obscure references, but that's something that's amused me, which I think I've probably never owned up to in an interview before because I thought they might get cut out uh, if anybody knew that I was doing that. And then we get, we get to The Expanse. And to me, the, the biggest story, the underlying, the backbone of The Expanse is resources. Everybody's fighting mm. about resources. So we've got this great concept of the belters, generations that have grown up in the asteroid belt working. So they've never experienced Earth gravity. This is, a, this is a theme that runs through the show. And the belters see themselves as the ones who do all the work that provide the resources for Earth and Mars and, and the other settlements. And the conflict is really about who's going to be in charge of the resources and how they get managed and, and, and how, they get, how they get shipped around the solar system. And I, it's hard for us to, to speak in an authoritative way about this, because this is obviously quite far in the future, probably several hundred years, at least in the future, if anything like this were to happen. But to me, that, it, that strikes me as very authentic. And we know that one of the reasons that asteroid mining, the concept of it has been so intriguing 
to independent spaceflight companies and investors is because the resources are out there if we could extract them from, from the asteroids. And so I particularly loved that show, as well as the 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 action scenes that are so well done. And I, I was watching I was watching Star Trek Strange New Worlds last night, which is uh, mm. has some really great moments in it. I, th- I think a bit for me, a bit of a mixed bag. But I will say Captain Pike probably has the best haircut of anyone on television. Fantastic. <laughs> but but so there's there's a combat scene. I don't want to give anything away, but but the Enterprise and another ship are in a combat scene with with aliens that those of you will see who it is in the final episode of this season. But this this kind of absurd motion where the, the ships are flying and they go, oh, quick, launch. Okay, there he is. Lock on, launch, launch photon torpedoes. And we know that combat in space would all be done by computers and it would be going so fast. And I think they show that in The Expanse. And I love the way the, mm-hmm. these ships are far away from each other and they're firing what are essentially, I suppose, uh, miniguns. They're, they're, they're like these... these uh, high speed, high velocity guns that are probably firing uh, armor piercing shells, and spaceships are fragile in the in the real world. If there was combat between the type of ships that we have now, it wouldn't take much to put one out of commission. You no, get a, you those get a couple speeds of you could be slugs through, and you you're could done. be firing frozen peas at them at those speeds <laughs> right. and take them out th- literally. They show they convey the speed, I think, in in the expanse very well. And also to some degree in, in the in the reboot of Battlestar Galactica. I think some of the combat scenes mm-hmm. there were done very well uh, also. Not to diminish the wonder of Star Trek. I we 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 have to accept that it's it's done in a it's more about the characters and, and the stories than scientific accuracy. And we we love it despite its its small flaws. Well, I, I, we could talk about this for hours, but oh, yes. unfortunately we can't. But I, I, I agree with you about The Expanse. And I guess if I was to look, you know, there's a lot more to discuss about what we read. But if I uh, if I look just at what we're watching in this uh, second decade, well, now third decade of the 21st century, I think The Expanse, uh, you know, if you remove the protomolecule, which is which is highly speculative fiction, but if you just look at the conditions in the ships, uh, the kind of, and there are people that would heartily disagree with this in terms of being desirable, but the sort of company town slash oil rig slash mining colony nature of the, the settlements that are being formed out there, because let's face it, what's going to advance the human expansion of the solar system is probably going to be more about profit than about science, at least in, in, in the larger sense of it, because it's going to be very expensive to do this. And if you can't get some financial return, not a lot of govern- governments are going to be driven past, uh, in my estimation anyway, the moon. You know, that's a place where you could set up a base for national glory and kudos in the international uh, stage. But much beyond that, you know, maybe Mars for a for a short lived outpost, but in terms of long term settlements where people are living and working, there's got to be some kind of financial return. And I think the expanse, in a rather dark way, has given us a good model of what that might be like. I'd like to think, in my in my warm fuzzy mind, that it'll be a friendlier environment to that without all that conflict. But we'll see. Agreed. Any last thoughts? And well, and I'd like to do. Just briefly look a little bit more at, at some at some predictive elements. If you look if you look at the the mar, some of the marvels that SpaceX has accomplished, to me in particular the landing of of the Falcon Nine on the drone barge. I mean, I watch it and I think I'm watching an episode of Thunderbirds. I didn't it, it after the initial. Through the the initial wonder or, or optimism that I had about spaceflight had had worn off in in my youth when it when the Apollo program was cancelled, I didn't think we were going to see anything like that mm, in in our lifetimes. Yeah. And so in in sci fi, spaceships are already in space, and many of them are they're reusable. And the ships that we see in in Babylon Five and and other shows that we love, these are enormous ships. These were constructed in space; they weren't blasted off the Earth. And so, if you build a ship in space, it doesn't have to be aerodynamic because it's never going to encounter an atmosphere. So, when I when I see the reusability of SpaceX ships, it makes me think about that. And also, Virgin Galactic's spaceship 
beautiful reusable spaceship series that that strikes me as something that that has grown the not just the look of the ships but the concept it feels like something that's grown out of science fiction the virgin galactic ship is gleaming and streamlined and gorgeous and amazing and is reusable and i i've always thought also to some degree the child of the x15 because it's basically doing mm-hmm. the same thing the b52 was dropping its launch it's launching a rocket from another plane which is which is fantastic so i i love this theme i think another another author we didn't we didn't really get to talk about we didn't get to talk about, about much at all is philip k dick who had a who had quite a a dark and accurate vision of the future which some readers have have said well he he imagined the internet he imagined virtual reality and you can see elements in in his in his work a lot of a lot of the best novels were written in the 50s and 60s that that presaged these things so there's a lot of it out there and and no doubt more still to come and the science fiction that's being written today in 50 or 100 years i wonder what people think when they look back and go gosh that that novel that was written in 2022 was spot on when it came to asteroid mining or a Mars base or or perhaps the discovery of the first signs of extraterrestrial life. Well, I, I think we're going to need to revisit this topic. I'd love to do so with you and maybe we'll get a science fiction author on with us. I know a couple that would um, probably take up most of the hour without us saying a thing, but uh, we have to yes, move please, on. Yes, please. Let's so, do it. Oh, let's yeah? do it. Yes, please. I, I, I nominate David Brin, but we'll have to see if he <gasps> wants to come join us or not. Oh, he would be fun. Wouldn't that be great? So I want to yeah. thank everybody for joining us for this grand discussion of human potential through sci-fi. Always, always a blast. And always, if you have anything to say about it or about anything else, you should email us at TWIS at twit.tv. That's TWIS at twit.tv. We welcome your comments. And uh, we'll respond accordingly. New episodes publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher. So make sure to subscribe and tell your friends and give us a big thumbs up or a couple of stars or whatever metric they use. And you can always head to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. You can follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook and twit.tv on Instagram. We'll see you next week. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. Thank you.